Hello and welcome to another episode of Brave UX. I'm Brendan Jarvis, Managing Founder of The Space In Between, the home of New Zealand's only specialist evaluative UX research practice and world-class UX lab, enabling brave teams across the globe to de-risk product design and equally brave leaders to shape and scale design culture. Here on Brave UX, though, it's my job to help you to put the pieces of the product puzzle together. I do that by unpacking the stories, learnings and expert advice of world-class UX design and product management professionals. My guest today is Tracy McGoldrick. Tracy is the head of UX research ops and design eminence at IBM in Austin, Texas, where she is currently creating the infrastructure to help accelerate IBM's cloud and cognitive software research practice. To put that into perspective, that's 90 researchers working on over 80 products. Before joining IBM in 2017, Tracy was the head of global photography and CG imaging at Dell Technologies. There, she led the talented teams who created the visual assets for the company while also running the operational aspects that supported them. A passionate evangelist for user experience and design thinking, Tracy actively works with all aspects of IBM's business to grow the relationships and the culture that develop awareness, appreciation, and ability in human-centered design practices. Someone who generously donates her time to causes she believes in, Tracy is a volunteer at Ronald McDonald House, which provides a home away from home to families with children undergoing hospital treatment. She is also a volunteer at Austin Pets Alive, a shelter designed to save animals that are most at risk of euthanasia. Described by her colleagues as someone who is humble, supportive, and possessing immense organizational agility, it seems that Tracy is perfectly suited to research operations, and I can't wait to speak with her about that. So, Tracy, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's nice to be here. It's nice to have you here, and it's also nice that I managed to get through your introduction after about take 47, <laughs> so much appreciated your patience. We've only got 20 minutes no, left in this good. interview as a result. <laughs> Tracy, I was looking into your work history, your educational history, your background, as I tend to do for these interviews, and I noticed that you studied, you studied communications art at a highly reputable college called Art Center in the United States. What was it about Art Center that drew you there? Oh, Art Center it just always had a history of just being the very best art school going, and I wanted to go there so badly. And... Actually, I was going to a different college and my roommate's boyfriend was switching over to Art Center. He was going to be a photographer. And he goes, oh, you really need to, to come over to Art Center. And I, yes, I do. This is fantastic. Um, <laughs> I put my portfolio together and lo and behold, got accepted. And uh, it, it was one of the most amazing experiences that I've had. It teaches you how to focus, get your work done. And learn actually from the very best because you're you're learning from people who are in the industry. So I just had the opportunity to work and learn from so many amazing people. Mm -hmm. I did note when I was researching Art Center that there are so many notable alumni. You know, you've got Rebecca Mendez, Zach Snyder. Uh, Larry Shinoda, amongst them, there's just so many fantastic creative people that have been there. And I believe you know another creative person who's very well regarded in the industry that went there as well. Quite well, in fact. Who is that person? Well, would you be talking about my husband, Kirk Weddle? I might be oh. indeed talking about your husband, Kirk Weddle. <laughs> yes, uh, Kirk and I actually met. He had graduated. I was just going to school and I met him at a party. Uh, Kirk Weddle photographed the baby Nirvana. So believe it or not, it's been, iconic. Yes, iconic. And I can't believe it's been 30 years ago that he did that. So it's been around for a long time and it just keeps popping up on um, all the best album covers of the year. And uh, I'm just thrilled to know, to know him, to be married to him. I'm really proud of him. And it's just such an amazing photo. Do you do you remember exactly? So you met at a party. You were saying, do you remember what that what that part whose party it was and set the scene for us? What what was that? What was the moment that sparks flew? Well, we'll bypass a few details, but um, okay, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> it was actually Kirk was throwing the party. It was a graduation party, oh, yeah. and 
I had just recently moved to LA and it was just one of these parties where like, oh my gosh, look at all this stuff and look where we're at. And it was just amazing. And he, I met him when I was walking through the door and he was giving out tequila shots. I don't know if I should say this on the, the show here, you know, but tequila shots, it's, everybody's it's, it's uh, rated. Uh, so we're yes, okay. Yes, yes, yes. So um, <laughs> that's actually how I met him and uh, met his best friend. The best friend wanted to date me. He, I introduced him to my best friend. I met Kirk, and there you go. All was history. Ended up, all was history. Yeah, well, dating for a year and then married. And you're obviously both two very creative people. What has, what was that like? That time in LA after you met, you know, when you're both pursuing your respective creative careers. You know, what, what were the standout moments or memories that you made during your time there? It was it was an amazing time because he was coming up at the same time I was going to school and mm. I, I got out of school and it was just an intense time, right? Because back then we would work 18 hour days, he would work 20 hour days. It was just crazy and we barely saw each other. So while we're on the topic of LA, I understand that when you were living there, you lovingly refurbished a 1920s bungalow, but you didn't get much time to enjoy that bungalow. What's the story there? Well, speaking of studios, let me just backtrack. Yeah, we had a beautiful 1926 bungalow that we did refurbish, and we thought, oh, let's just rent this out for movies or commercials. It was such a cool house. Maybe maybe it'll go. First try, we we got a take and we rented it out for a commercial shoot, and we moved into. They moved us into this wonderful hotel. It was fantastic, and that's the whole reason we were doing it. We wanted to be able to get out, go to hotels, <laughs> and go to cold restaurants. And so, but we got a phone call in the kind of the early morning, and the producer at the time of the the commercial said, "You know, um, Tracy, you got to get." over here your house is on fire I'm like what? i thought he was messing around but because yeah. we had you know we were getting along pretty good with these guys so i'm like this is not funny because no really your house your house is on fire and what had happened we did refurbish the 1926 bumbo but we did not refurbish the heater that was in the floor and what oh. had happened is they had covered the floor to protect the hardwood and overnight it just uh, smoked well, the fire was just smoldering and smoldering and smoldering and then it just went up. What had happened, the house, the whole house didn't burn down. There was just a hole in the center. And so, <laughs> <laughs> needless to say, we had to imagine. move out. Yeah. And, uh, but, yeah. yeah. So, but kind of a cool thing. I mean, fast forward many, many, many years, Kirk's out to lunch with uh, one of his uh, art director buddies. And he, he would, because guy I just heard this weird story from one of the, the advertising agencies here that I work with, he was telling me about this house that he had rented out for a shoot and the house had caught on fire and they didn't get to finish the shoot or anything like that. And Kirk's like, are you kidding me? He goes, that was my house. And so it was just this weird coincidence of people, you know, 15 plus years later of finding out who had actually been part of the team that caught the house on fire. But we, we love those guys. I'm not going to say their name on a, on the radio, but they're in Austin. <laughs> so it's kind they're of in funny. Austin now. They're in Austin, yeah. <laughs> Did Kirk make it uh, awkward for that person? They actually went out to lunch, so it wasn't too awkward. Oh, it was okay. just, yeah, oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> well, but, hopefully they were generous with the settlement for uh, re re the reparations for the damage that they oh, did. They're probably still suing each other over that one. I, I, <laughs> I don't know. It was a, it was a mess. <laughs> so just fast forwarding a bit now. So after eight years at Dell in 2017, you finished up as the, as I mentioned in the intro, the head of global photography and CG imaging before you headed to IBM. That seems like a massive shift to go from imagery to research operations. Was it? And, you know, what was that transition like? Well, can I back up even further? Yeah, like, absolutely. All right. My, my whole career has been a little bit different. It's, I've loved it. Wouldn't change a thing, but I started out as a designer and and uh design's my my true passion and love but user-centered design really is and it, it comes full circle so i did start out as as a um as a designer 
But even when I was back in Art Center, I was always incorporating photography into my work. And I, I love photography. But so I transitioned for, in from being a, d- a designer into doing some design work at, at, at um, Dell as well. But then the director at the time, I love photography, always had a passion for it. We had great photographers at, at Dell and we were incorporating um, video as well into some of our deliverables to help sell the product. And uh, what happened is he, you know, we, we needed to operationalize the, the photography, video, and then pulling in CGI. So it, it was just a happy accident, I guess, where he saw the ability to um, have that operations background and then come in to help build that team and build out the team so we could create just amazing assets for, for, for Dell. And I have to say that team is still going strong and uh, just creating some of the most beautiful imagery going. And you mentioned winding back the clock a little, and I want to wind it back uh, a little bit further because I do remember in your um, LinkedIn profile that you also worked, you had your own agency, I believe, for a number of years leading up to around about 2008, 2009. So it sounds, uh, that's correct, right? Right, right. You're exactly right. And that was all geared around photography. So um, yeah. Yeah. So most definitely have all of that in my my background. And so pulling that into the operations at at Dell, which makes more sense now, right? But yeah, so the trajectory did, I, I did start my own company called Talent Wrangler. And Talent Wrangler was all centered around photography, pulling in the, the stylists and the photographers and the production folks all to create these amazing photo shoots for different customers at the time. And um, I was based up in Seattle then. And, uh, you know, coming back to to Dell, it was, it was just this amazing opportunity. And I remember when I started there, I wasn't working with the photo and video studio, but previous director said, well, what do you want to do? And I wrote it down and I said, I would love to be able to manage the photo video studio. And I found that, I forgot that I had even written that down for her. And I found that I'm like, wow, I, my dream came true. <laughs> and all of that wrangling, you know, you, you mentioned talent wrangler and all the operational aspects of making creative productions happen. I imagine that that has been a skill that you've developed over time and that has served you well now at IBM running research operations. You know, you've been there for, I think it's a little over four years now. And for about the last 18 months or so, you've been running the research operations practice there, as I mentioned, just so that people have uh, some idea or some better context about that area of research operations that you're working in. What is the IBM cloud and cognitive software research practice all about? What are the questions that it's trying to answer questions that we're trying to answer all the time is how how can we make our product better for our product users it, it really is that so ibm has over three thousand designers and we i am focused on product design with under um an amazing vp arn bomic and he is Pulling in, you know, we, we have over 635 designers under under Arn, and then we have now over 100 researchers within over that 100 design. Now. Wow. Right, right. So it keeps growing, and mm. the thing that we want to do is make sure that we are talking to our product users to constantly improve our user experience, and that's really what this research group is all about: is getting the research to the correct product teams to help them create better products for our end users. So as I mentioned, you've been, you've been now in that research operations role for about 18 months. You know, did this role exist before it was yours or is it something that you've really stepped into fresh and have shaped without really any, any, any guardrails or anything else that preceded it? Well, that's a great way to describe it. I stepped into this fresh and created this amazing team and we created this amazing team because it's not me it's it's so many amazing people such talented people on this research ops team but the way it happened was our team started off as being five researchers and now it's over 100 researchers it just was growing so so quickly and the the researchers were doing all this amazing work but it really had become the wild west and I say that because 
everybody was doing their own, they had their own processes. We were storing all of our researchers, in, our, our research in box. Once it goes in a box, you're like, where is it? I can't find it. It kind of goes in there <laughs> and, and has the potential to die. We don't want that to happen. And, you know, and we were just pulling all these different teams together. And so we needed to create a team that could operationalize research. And we did that by creating the research ops team. Where did you start? Like, I mean, when you walk into something and it's a blank canvas, as a designer, you'll probably know just how intimidating a blank canvas can be. Uh, where did you Where did you start? What was the thing you focused most of your, your efforts on first? Well, there was a team, including myself, we had four people. Mm -hmm. The first thing that we did was we did our own research. And <laughs> we needed to go back and figure out, okay, we think we know what you need to be successful, but really, what is it? that you need from us to be more successful. So we did do our research and it came back very, very, we needed the infrastructure to create it. We needed processes. We needed to be able to talk to our end users and uh, we needed a way to find our research acti our activities that we've all done. So it was very clean cut for us um, where to start. Now we just needed to actually go and do that and put it together. And uh, we did it very successfully, I'm happy to say. And it's a we. It's always a we because um, they're the ones that, that did it, the, the team. And uh, now we actually are going to have 12 people on our team in over, you know, just a little over a year and a half. So it's growing leaps and bounds. Let's talk about the we side of things because, like you said, it's not, not, not just one person that makes change happen, particularly at scale at which we're talking about here at IBM. What is the composition or the makeup of different roles in the team and how has that changed over time? So you went from four to start with and now you've got treble that at 12 soon. How has the team changed over time? What roles do you have in the team and where is the team's focus currently? That was unfair. That was about three questions. But I think <laughs> hope, hope, hopefully you, you sort of can find something in there uh, to jump off at. Well, yes. I, what I could do is to, <laughs> tell you where we are now, and I could even work yeah. back, backwards. Let's but, do that. So the team is is put together to accelerate the product design research practice, right? And so we categorize these into these different squads or teams within the larger team. We have one group focusing on customer engagement and panel recruitment optimization. So that's one one team. We have research enablement, that's another team. We have technology and data-driven insights, that's another team. And then we have this newer team that is added, which is design eminence and practices. And so for panel recruitment and optimization and that customer engagement, that um, we have a fantastic uh, project manager assigned to that with um, a couple of program managers, which really focus on on one side, our user experience program, which are our actual customers that we talk to are, are in our IBM product users that give us feedback. And then we also have different ways of talking with our customers and potentially not customers, right? We want, we want to make sure that we're getting feedback from, from many different areas. So that's one area of focus. Research enablement is all around the tool management, vendor management, making sure that we and they are data privacy compliant. I mean, that's something that's happened over the past two years. That's, that's radically different, right? And uh, we needed to make sure that we have education and best practices in place. We created a resource library and then onboarding and offboarding as well. We have a really cool team, which is this ta uh, technology and data-driven insights. And to start off, we created a global repository, but we needed a way for all of IBM to be able to go in and find our research. And the repository is a little bit overwhelming for people outside of research. And so what we did is we created our own, I would say it's a, it's our own smart library. And we did this in under a year. And so it's one of our new products that we have for IBM. It's called IBM Sheldon. 
And there's a little bit of story behind that, but it's the Total Experience Insights Library. We also are creating what we're calling the Voice what, of the Customer. Let's customers. go into that story. What is that Uh-oh. story behind Sheldon? Let's let's dive into that. Well, okay. So our team is is uh, referred to as a bunch of tur- we're turtles. And so my fabulous manager's name is Eric Malstead, and he he loves turtles. And the reason why is because he says they stick their nets out and they always get things done. So we're all turtles. And when we created this user research library, of course you need a name. You need something that's memorable so people could go to it, right? And so we're trying to think of a name one day and we're just spitballing some different names about. And um, one of the guys goes, Sheldon, because Sheldon uh, from a turtle. So IBM Sheldon came about and there, there's that name stuck. And so now, it, <laughs> and we love it and we even have our own identity that is beautiful design turtle uh, so that's ibm sheldon which is our library and the voice of the customer so love it um, makes a lot of sense and there's also that the whole turtle and the hair story that comes to mind when you mention that as well there's a, a a number of um of interesting sort of uh i suppose attributes you can apply to turtles and particularly in the research context Oh, absolutely. You, you know, you, you take your time, do it right. It's very methodical. And I have to say that these turtles are, are the beautiful swimming type of turtles. So not that the other type of turtles are not beautiful. I'm going to get in trouble for saying that. <laughs> these are all the, you know, they're all the turtles beautiful. are beautiful people. <laughs> all turtles are beautiful people. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's just put that um, perspective into perspective for people though, as well around the repository. So I understand that the repository holds over 17,000 files with, across 80 products. That's now accessed by over a hundred researchers, which is definitely no small undertaking. And like you said, initially it's quite, it was quite intimidating for people to try and figure out exactly where the insights were within this thing. It's quite massive. Now, what was it that you you did uh, and during that design process to really make that content accessible and understandable and findable for the people that were outside of the core research team? Well, that's exactly why we created Sheldon because there are all of these, these assets available, but it's like, all right, how do I, how do I find them? We know, but they don't. And so this needs to go out to the product teams, the product managers, the developers. It needs to go out to our vice presidents and the CEO. And, you know, we want this accessible to all 300,000 IBMers. And so that's what it is now. So everybody within IBM now has access to these product design research findings. So you go in, it's easily searchable. You let's just say cloud pack for data. That's one of our fabulous products. You um, type in cloud pack for data and all the, the research activities that have been done are available to them and they could go in there and finesse the, the research findings as well. But it's supposed to help all of our product teams have access to the research that's gonna provide insights on where they should go for the new product roadmap, what needs to be changed, what needs to not be changed, it's just, it's supposed to be that one-stop shop for this valuable information that they did not have access to before Sheldon was created. Yeah, hundred percent. So I might've misunderstood that. So is Sheldon the interface that you use to query the repository or is it the repository itself? It's the front end to the repository. Got it. Okay. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm interested in understanding how you are helping your product teams or the researchers that you're supporting to recruit reliably and regularly enough participants to run studies with? Right. I think that's a challenge for every single company out there, trying to get enough people to talk to, to provide insights. And what we're doing is we work together as as a team. It's really up to everybody within that product team, product team meaning designers, researchers, product managers, developers, all to bring in, actually, and I'm going to grow it, tech sales, sales, everybody, any anybody and everybody that has a pipeline to a customer that can provide insights, they need to bring those people back to the team so we can actually talk to them. And that is what we're working on now is trying to find these, these ways to more effectively get access to these customers who have all these valuable 
all this valuable information. And so it's really a very difficult job. If you talk to anybody within research, they're always saying, I need more, I need more, I need more <laughs> people to talk to. And yeah. we, we get it, but we we do talk to people in the field when we go to re, um, when we go to events. We talk to our customers there. We have what we call the user experience program, where it is a program that our product users can join to provide insights with our researchers and our designers and our product teams. So right, so there's like a panel that they can join. It, it is that exactly. Yeah. It's a little bit different from a lot of diff- uh, other companies out there. So we, we do have this one panel and we call them partners because our, our product users do become our partners when they're part of this, this, this program. And what we do with them is we like to meet with our customers at least once a month, but we need to make sure that we're talking to people within different industries and different company sizes. That, so we're ensuring that we're creating a product that, everybody can use instead of just potentially one group. Um, so we're constantly trying to get new people to join these, this program to engage with us and, and talk. And it's really beneficial to the customer, the product user, as well as our teams, because they really have a seat at the table. And uh, it's quite an amazing experience. And the, the product users and our customers that actually have been involved for many years, they they love it. We love it. And uh, we just have this open collaboration, which is extraordinary. And we can't do it without them, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Researching in a vacuum doesn't lead to very many useful findings, does it? You mentioned no. collaboration. And that's that's also important, I suppose, for us to um, dive into the collaboration that exists between, say, yourself leading up the research operations practice and the other areas of the business that the research operations practice supports. I mean, obviously, there's research, but I was curious to know just how you are structuring your relationships or what those working relationships look like between, say, yourself and research or engineering or product. Like, how are you... Um, how are you supporting them and what does that relationship look like? Well, we all have to support each other. <laughs> we, we really do to get the, the job done. And it's, so our, our, our teams are formed around a, a minimum of three in the box. So three in the box, here are the researchers, the product managers and the developers. And, but it does extend past that. When, when we have the, the teams that are working, I would say, super high functioning we're, we're talking also with the tech sales and the sales and we all collaborate our product managers have what we call cabs right the customer advisory board so we get involved with those to be able to provide uh, show show unreleased designs to our customers within the cabs and like those cabs are great sister prog- um, programs to our user experience program so we try as best we can to always be working together to make sure that we get feedback from our customers. If we're getting the feedback from our customers, we're giving it right back out to all of the teams that need it. Because it's not just us, it's, it's research, yes, but it's also the product managers they and the developers need the same information to be able to make informed decisions. And in terms of you, yourself, like in terms of the leadership role that you occupy, where is most of your time invested with the other people that are your peers in other practice areas or, or areas of the business? Or what do you spend most of your time doing or talking about with them? With my peers? Yeah, with your um, peers. With my peers. So many different peers in many different areas. But um, from on the research side, we're just trying to make sure that we're grow- growing the research operations team to be beneficial to them. We do meet once a once a week just to to align and make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to design uh directors design managers making sure that we're listening to their needs as well because without good research how can you have good design or and vice versa you need each other right to be able to create magic so it it really is just a, a constant game of of talking collaborating, feedback. And as we like to say at IBM, we have this constant, we have that that figure eight or that infinity. We are constantly rein, reinventing what needs to be reinvented and continuing on with what's working well. 
tell me about that, that figure eight. What has been working really well and what is in need of reinvention currently? I would say research ops is working very well. It's been, That's good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. And it's let our researchers focus on research, right? Before they were having to do a lot of this and maintain their databases and try to figure out how to do all this work. And it was overwhelming. So now the researchers get to focus on their craft, which, which is amazing. I would say what needs to be reworked is we grew so quickly. And I think a lot of people can probably align with this, that this team grew so quickly that now we're pulled, we brought in four project managers in their um, respective areas to help us make sure that we are being as effective that we can, that we actually are prioritizing our deliverables, that we're hitting our deliverables within the allocated time frame, that we're focusing on what needs to be focused on. And so that iteration is ongoing right now, and it's been pretty magical. Well, let's talk ab- about that iteration, about hitting deliverables, about the the measures of effectiveness of research operations. I was uh, was interested to to dive into what that looks like for you. You know, how do you know? How do you know if your team, the research operations team, is doing a great job or not? What are you tracking? What are you looking for? What are those clues and signals? Well, we have our OKRs, and so we're always laddering back, we have our, our monthly check-ins on our on our OKRs to make sure that we are we're hitting those. But also we have feedback forms to the research operations team. And so the researchers and designers are not shy. So if we're not doing something well, they they let us know. And that's great because how do we know what to fix if we're if nobody gives us feedback. So we do have a, a on Sheldon we have feedback. On our own we have feedback. We also have created these different, within a a specific um, specialty, I would say, we have research vocals that are kind of our, I don't want to call them go-betweens, but there are person, there are researchers that go between research ops and their teams to help bring us what, you know, feedback, how do we improve, what do we improve, and then also they go back and help evangelize what we've just created or what we've just released to that team. So, you know, with a big team like this, we rely on a lot of different people to help us do our job even better. Um, but it really is a constant, iter- you know, iteration. And just when you're growing so quickly, um, and the team needs change as well. And then, you know, of course, you're you're bringing in new people and they need to learn the ropes. They need to be onboarded. They need to know what tools to use and how to use them. So it's a it's a very busy job and it's yeah. never boring. And I, I imagine in the last eighteen months, also with COVID, because I know that Texas and Austin in particular was quite badly hit. At least uh, at one point when I was looking at what was going on over in the US, I'd imagine that most of these people that have been coming on board during that time may have had to have done that remotely. Like how have how has the how has COVID impacted your ability to to bring people into the team to get them familiar? You know, what have been some of the interesting learnings or challenges that have come out of this uh, awful pandemic situation that we're all facing around the world? Well, I have to say, I hope everybody's doing okay and and that we could get out of this pandemic situation soon. But to answer your question, actually, the research operations team was formed during COVID, so we've always been remote. We've ne- never been able to work together in the same room. And so we started that way and we worked, you know, we tried different ways of working together. And uh, what we do is we get together every Monday and we have working sessions instead of meetings, which I try to minimize Mm. meetings, but you have to be able to work (laughs) together, right? So if they're called working sessions, that means you get on and if you were going to be in a room together, you, you create in that form. And that's been really effective. We have just to keep people in sync and learning about each other and just having some fun. We have a monthly culture club. So we, we do call it the club, culture club and one person leads it each month. And we come with different ideas, um, different one day people know that I want to live in Italy one day and they, they um, hired one of the guys from um, Airbnb who 
taught us how to speak in Italian with our hands because that's creative. <laughs> <laughs> but it was always something just to keep the team together. And I would have to say, knock on wood, this team, Research Ops, has been very worked very effectively together. We really have not had issues because we started that way. But I know other teams have had trouble and p individuals have had trouble. A lot of people work better when they are face to face. They need that face time and we're all missing that and we're all looking forward to getting back into the office. But I know each individual manager works with the, the people that are having more of the difficulties working remotely. You know, and I spend a good chunk of my day just just talking with people and making sure that they are okay and how can we get you through this spot if it's if there's trouble. You know, during this time it's been people have had to put their lives on hold, as you know, and people wanted to get married and they couldn't and they had to figure out different ways of getting married. And you know, you, you deal with the personal side of somebody's life as well as their their business and you really become part of a family, you know, in a, in a way you, you get to know each other inside and out as, as much as they want to give or, or listen to me. And most of us do. And it's, it's really been a learning experience for me too, just to learn how to listen more and uh, take in what people are giving me and try to help them as best I can. Yeah. The, the boundary between work life and personal life literally has been obliterated as a result of COVID-19. And it's it interesting, has. you say that your team formed during this time. So your ways of working and your rhythm, your ability to get the job done, wasn't as necessarily badly impacted as, as say some of those other people that are more used to that face to face or have been operating in that physical context. It sounds like even that being so just given the situation that we've all found ourselves in that there is a, a lot of stress, not just in terms of what's going out in the world with COVID-19, but you're in an operational role. So you have, and you mentioned before, like the feedback that teams are giving you and designers don't pull their punches, you know, when things aren't working, you're getting it kind of on the nose, I would imagine at, at, at sometimes, right? So you're having to deal with all of the stuff going on. It's a high stress environment. What have you been doing to help the team to see that for what that is and manage those pressures while the whole world seems to have been burning around us. Burning around us is absolutely right. I really think it's that, that being available to them, mm. making sure that we talk with each other as much as we need to, um, give them their space as much as they need <laughs> yeah. as well. Really try to cut down on meetings so people can actually focus and, and get some head down time and then making sure that I have one-on-ones with each one of these fabulous team members because I need to make sure that they're they're okay um, if they need some extra time to do something of course we work through that this who, who makes sure that you're okay <laughs> Kirk <laughs> Eric <laughs> my my fabulous manager RN he checks into our, our VP. Mm -hmm. I could keep going. It's it's a it's been a, a real amazing time because you really learn about the people that you're working with and how much they actually really do care. Seriously, it it kind of blew me away. And that the culture at IBM is something so different than I had any anywhere else. And it is a really caring environment. You know, it, it's it's work too. You work your butt mm -hmm. off, but <laughs> but these these people are always there for you. And uh, what do you what do you attribute that up. to? Yeah, what do you attribute that to? Because I mean, culture doesn't just. I mean, that is such a a broad topic, culture, right? But you're in this environment. You've obviously seen different cultures. You've worked at Dell and others. And I'm not going to ask you an unfair question to compare one to the other. But when you think about when you think about IBM's culture, what is it that Who's, who's setting the tone for this to develop? Or has this been something that has just emerged as the result of the type of people that IBM employs? This one stems, it goes up and down, you know? The leadership's insanely amazing. And if you think, if you look back through all of IBM's years, culture has been really important. And, and culture goes many ways, equality, caring for each other, you, you just, you really do look back through IBM's history and it's always been that way. But, but to be fair, I haven't been around through all of IBM's um, <laughs> years, thank God. And um, I, 
do know the leadership within the design community has always been astounding. And it just, it just blossoms from there. And when we all are hiring people, we want to make sure that we are hiring not only insanely creative, amazing designers, but people that are inclusive as well. And uh, it, just, it, it stems from the top. And it, it, like I said, it goes up and down because every single one of us has that responsibility to each other as well. And we, we do it. I want to bring the focus back to research ops now, because I, I, I am fascinated. This, you, I obviously talked about this transition from imagery and photography into research operations, and there's clearly a very strong operational line that you can draw between the, those two aspects. And being a designer, as you've mentioned, there's also that experience that you have about knowing what that process is like and how we how important people are in that process you know that human centered design aspect but you have relatively fresh eyes in terms of the last 4 years in research specifically what do you believe the biggest misconception or misunderstanding there is that people have about research operations and what it's actually there to do well research operations is fairly new right Design operations yeah. came first, and then we have research operations. And I could get in trouble with some people for what I'm going to say, but I, I think one thing that a lot of companies don't understand is how you really do need a team to form research operations. And I know sometimes you're constricted by budgets and how many people you can hire and so forth, but if you hire the right people to be within this, this team, the research ops team, it's going to be effective you know, because one one person can't do it alone. You you just you you need to be able to have people in these different categories to help create panels to to manage the tools to manage the relationships to build out these repositories to get the word out. There's that the whole design eminence side is all about spreading the the word and getting the word out to people that want to come to IBM design to work and spreading the word about the culture and and what we're doing and talking about research operations and how important it is at IBM and and why yeah well let's pick up on the design eminence side of things so you're okay. you're obviously being tasked with this role of of spreading that sort of se seems to me at least to be almost like an evangelistic type role of, mm -hmm. of getting the word out there about design. You know, and I, I'd asked earlier just around the misconceptions that people might have around research ops, but seeing as your role also spreads into trying to educate people about design, its impact, what it's all about, how it can help, why they should get involved with it or, or, or seek its input. Are you are you hearing any sort of outdated thinking that exists out there or some again misconceptions that people have about design that you're trying to set people you know straight on like what what is the general reception you've been getting well the way I can answer that is I can just tell you what I what I want to get out of this and what we want to get out of this so with with design eminence we want people to know what a great community of designers we have within the IBM design community and for me specifically within the IBM product design community. IBM is a product-driven, customer-centric company, right? And without these products, that's what IBM is about. And so with this design eminence, we want to make sure that customers, people, um, potential customers, designers all know what great products we have, that we're winning awards for the great user experiences that we're, we're creating. And we want people to try our products, try our products and give us feedback so we can make even better products for them. And so that's, that's really what this whole design eminence and practices team is about. And also if we're talking about all these great products and the awards that we're winning, that's also going to let these new designers that are coming out of Art Center and SCAD, and forgive me if I'm not naming your school, but I know you all are fantastic designers out there. We want to talk to them because we want the very best designers working on our, our products. So it really is this full circle holistic thing. You know, if you talk about how great our product experiences are, then and you're winning awards, then the designers come and then you just have this uh 
this fantastic place. And it is a fantastic place that we're trying to build out to, I, to work. I'm just remembering my conversation with Jane Austen. She runs the, she's chief experience officer at Digitas, which is a, an advertising agency in the UK. And prior to that, she was at Babylon Health and a couple of other, I think, um, Moo as well, um, digital product companies. And she actually, in my notes here, I just remembered she had mentioned in one of her presentations that IBM, and I don't quite know what the time frame is, but I'm assuming it's in the last decade or so, has invested a hundred million million US dollars in hiring designers and transforming the business. And now at the time that this research was current, there was one designer for every eight other roles in the company. And that to me is a huge vote of confidence in the role of design in the enterprise. How much of that have you seen since you started? Because I imagine the last four years, like you said, the team's grown from four to 12. You've got now over 100 researchers. Just what is going on? Like how much energy and investment is being made in design at the moment at IBM? It's it's amazing. And she's exactly right. So I'm not going to get the, the exact number. But when I first started a little bit over four and a half years ago, I think it was one to six. I want to say 24, one to 16, and then now it is one to eight. And one to eight is what we were trying to get to. Um, one one designer to every other eight. You know, and product. why is this important, right? I just get the sense that you don't go from one to 24 or one to 16 to then go to one to eight without a real, like a real purpose behind that. You know, what is it that you believe IBM has seen or is waking up to that they are investing, that your company is investing so heavily in design. Why do this? Because IBM is a design-centered company, period. And back in the, the day, I believe you, it would be more heavily um, development-centric. And you need both. And so being design-centric, you're, you're marrying development and product management and design together to bring the very best out of what we can create. And with having one to eight with that designer, designers have a seat at the table when they're talking to ensure that the user experience that we're creating is one that is great, easy to use, makes people's lives easier, makes them want to use IBM products. That's really why IBM is so um, invested in growing our the number of designers that work with us. And of course there are other areas within IBM that have designers and I'm speaking very more more on the, in the sense of the, the product design, but it's really true. You you need a designer to be able to create a, a, an amazing user experience. And you need, and designer in there also includes research. I need to make sure that that's perfectly clear because you need research, you need design and it's, it's they're married. Mm, 100%. You spoke earlier about, I mean, this seems to me to be a strategic decision, right? And you spoke earlier about how the research operations team or function that you lead has OKRs that you're laddering back up to, to sort of look at how you're performing, right? And I don't know if you can disclose, I don't want you to tell, tell me anything that you're not, not allowed to from an IBM point of view, um, but I am interested to know, like, what are the, the, the company OKRs or, or, or the, the major OKRs that are uh, uh, symptomatic of this change in strategy to focus more on design rather than on being engineering led? Well, I'm not going to go into all the OKR detail, but really what it comes down to is just really what I, I, I said before is ensuring that design is at the forefront of the conversation. So if, if you pull in a customer that has a bad experience using your product and you've done it many times, you know, I've whatever it is, what you're trying to do, and it's a bad experience, you don't want to use that product again, right? And so if if you have different competitors out there that are creating a product that's easier to use, therefore they, they, they the product user, feel that it's the product that they want their company to buy, then that's the way they go. With having many different, you know, having all these designers, these great designers, researchers at the table creating these amazing user experiences in IBM, is going to be able to create these great product experiences and user experiences for potential customers and our current customers, right? So that that's really that that's the gist behind it is just making sure that we're creating products that our cust our customers and product users love and never and, want to leave and never want to leave exactly. 
Yeah, I um, I was speaking to someone, it might have been Jared Spool a few months ago, and we touched on this notion that design is really a uh, competitive advantage might be somewhat of an outdated business term, but it's really trying to reinforce the moat that exists around the organization and protects it from competitors just coming in and copying essentially what it is that they've done. It's very easy to to copy what you see on the outside, but it's very difficult to copy the the entire experience that the organization's delivering. It, the experience and yes, the, the insides, right? Um, mm. you, you can't you can't copy that. And you really do need to have just a, a, a seamless experience when you're working with a with a product. And these are you know, enterprise products, they're, they're complex. And we're trying to make complexity as simple as possible. So people could get on with their day and get more done, instead of just trying to figure out how to use a product to make something, you know, get through their day, we want to make it quicker and easier and better for them. Yeah, I'm, actually, I'm just referring to something, one of my notes here, I had recently, again, I had a conversation, I don't know if you've come across uh, Dr. Laura Faulkner? In your travel, she's also based in Austin. I know um, the she, name. She, she runs uh, research at she's a UX research director at Rackspace, I believe. Oh, also. okay. Yes, I think that's in Austin. It's in Texas anyway. It is. Yes, it is. And her favorite design quote, which I recently posted on LinkedIn, is um, by a, a gentleman called Arthur Block, and he said, "It's a simple matter to make things complex. It is a complex matter to make things simple." And I think that really applies to what you've just said there, Tracy, about the challenges and the complexities of enterprise UX. It is, and very when you you have something very complex and you make it simple, it's uh, it's a wonderful thing for your product users, right? <laughs> they get so much yeah, more uh, done. And I imagine the operations team doesn't often or always get the credit that it deserves in making its role that it played in making that happen. I, I just want to come back to uh, something you touched on earlier, which was the, the, the rise in data privacy in terms of regulation and legislation that has happened since you've been involved in the field of research operations. So obviously, we had the EU in 2018 bring GDPR into effect, into effect, and I understand there's also been some similar legislation, albeit mainly at the state level in the US. I think California, California. passed some, yeah, some pretty strong data privacy laws, which probably touch most, um, most uh, companies if they've got customers in California. What has been the impact of these uh, regulations and legislations on the way that the UX research is able to be practiced and some of the things that from an operations perspective that you need to be more mindful of than you may have necessarily been in the past? Many, many, many things. You need to make sure that people's identities are protected, names, emails. When you're talking to somebody like we're talking now, you need to make sure that they're aware that they are being recorded with their face and or their voice. You need to get um, permission to do so. You need, once they do sign, uh, legal agreements has changed uh, enormously, but you also need to make sure that all the content that you have with people's voices or their, their, their selves is removed after 24 months or getting the, or go back and get their approval again. Just making sure that the right legal agreements are signed and documented. Um, when people are reaching out and they go, hey, we need to talk to more people and I, I need all these, to, they're asking for help with um, different people to speak with and you need to protect the privacy. You just don't go sending out spreadsheets with all these people's names. That's, you know, not that that would ever happen in the past, but you do not do that. It, it, that's why research operations is so important too on just creating the processes behind actually being able to talk with somebody. And I would say if you're talking to anybody within the industry, that's one of the top things, getting people in there and protecting their privacy and getting the, the names back out for the researchers, designers, people to talk with. It was challenging and a workload and also is challenging just keeping up with what changes, right? Have I, have I brought back some bad memories, have I? Y yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yes. Tracy. Yes, you have. Can you tell? Uh, did, no. did, did you find that during this process, I mean, I imagine you have to educate the 
other areas of the business as this is happening, right? Like it's not just, it's going to be as easy as it was before maybe for product teams or designers to go and speak with customers. You know, did you get any pushback from people? Did people getting grumpy? You know, you're in that operational seat, so it kind of flows to you. Like, were you getting anyone, yeah, like I said, getting grumpy about the extra red tape that you have to go through now to engage with participants? I think the biggest word that came was why. Well, why, 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 you know, when we're doing that research saying the five whys, why, and it, what it did was we just really needed to go back and re-educate everybody because if you're not aware of all the changes, it does get frustrating. Why can't I just go talk to somebody? And once they understand what the, the guidelines are, and now everybody does, cause it's been around for a while, but when it was first coming out, it was really frustrating because you, just didn't have immediate access to as many people as you did in the past. And so you really had to change the way that you went about talking to people, keeping their information private and, um, and removing all that information as well when needed. So thinking about that, thinking about that sort of why, why is this happening? The red, red tape and the hoops that you have to go through now in order to get in front of people in your observation, have you seen this have a negative effect or a slowing down or at least momentarily of insights flowing into the organization and and therefore being applied in design to shape better products? I would say what it's done is make our jobs more difficult on the research operation side because it's on our team to make it not frustrating, more seamless for them to talk with customers. If you talk to them, they 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 may say, hey, everybody's always saying I need more, I need more, I need more. But it's really up to us to try and get in front of these people and figure out new ways to get people to talk with these the, the researchers and, and the designers. I think it's probably more frustrating for us than anybody else because we have all that red tape in front of us that we're trying to maneuver through to try to get access to talk to people. And uh, don't get me wrong, data privacy is is needed, um, but you also need a way to talk to customers and, and product users or else you can't create better products. And so it's, it's finding this way, this new way of working together with everybody to try and figure out how to do it better. It's, it's, it's in its infancy stage right now, and we are all trying to figure out how do we do this better. Yeah, and I imagine that particularly from the enterprise, there will be some probably quite well-founded aversion to risk when it comes to making missteps, particularly with some of the punitive damages that the, the likes of the EU has and can apply. I think it's somewhat something like 10% of profit for the year or something. It's up huge. To. It's, it's, like, it's like, yeah, so no wonder you lost a little bit of sleep over yeah, it. Yeah, you, you don't mess with that. And uh, mm -hmm. you, you do immediately find a way to protect everybody's identity. And uh, yeah, it, it, went, it was black and white, open, shut, you know, immediately. And, and I want to go back and say, hey, we were not just <laughs> throwing people's information out there. We, we were not doing that. It was just that the regulations came down and you just had to be able to make sure and improve it right and and create a way that things are really locked down and only people that need that information have it so just a lot of changes i won't force us to dwell on that for too long <laughs> because it, You're like you said before it, it was some bad memories maybe there so we'll leave yeah. that one in the past I, I also understand tracy that part of your role you've taken an active role in mentoring team members and interns in particular is that mentoring role that you've been playing is that something that has come to you naturally is this something that you when you look back at who you are and how you've worked with others is this something that you've seen you can see as a pattern Yes, because I, I love it. I really love helping people do their very best work or see the very best that they can become. I would say that's probably one of my, my most favorite thing that I do every day. And um, I'm gonna call it, we have a um, really interesting diverse group of people on the team, which includes designers, researchers, data scientists, and 
and engineers. And one of the researchers on our team right now is a back end, front end, and now going to be full stack developer. And uh, if you ever would have told me that back in back in the day that I would have data scientists and developers, engineers on the team, I would say, really, that's going to be interesting. But <laughs> you know, it, mentoring this this um, person has been quite wonderful, and he teaches me a lot. He tells me I help him and teach him a lot too, just from experience. And uh, it's it really does make my day when people can come to you and go, wow, you really helped me. Thank you. You know? Yeah. There's often nothing, nothing better than, than that is it hearing that from somebody else that you've made a difference in their life. Yeah, it is. That's pretty wonderful. So with the, the mentoring, I, I, the reason why I discovered this is someone, one of your mentees, your previous interns um, gave, gave you a shout out on LinkedIn, which I happen to see. Is this really? something that yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're, they're very complimentary, <laughs> very complimentary and, and very thankful of the time that they'd spent with you and the team at IBM. Is is this something that is instituted in the culture or the structure of the way in which IBM works? Or is this something that you're doing yourself in addition to what you would do as leading of leading this team? Um, mentoring is, is definitely one of the big initiatives at IBM, mentoring and coaching, you know, being able to help people. And there's a big difference between mentoring and coaching too, you know, sometimes just telling people how to do something if they're open to doing it and then help on the flip side, being able to get them to work through it and figure it out on their own. Yeah, it, this is huge at IBM, which is also another reason why I'm thrilled that I work there. It's, it's, it's really important and it's always been part of my end of year review as well, something that I put down that I'm proud of. Yeah, I was coming back to Jane Austen, who I mentioned earlier, we were talking about the state of design and in, in, in its broad, broader sense, so like we talked about, including research and how there's this preference, at least at the moment, it seems to be a global preference to hire mid-career or mid-level designers up. And there is a general lack of emphasis being placed on interns, junior talent and developing that talent to become our future intermediate and senior and design leaders. And w we were wondering, and I'm keen to get your thoughts on this too, you know, what what have you observed? But And if you've observed something similar, where does this leave design, the, the state of enterprise design in say 10 years, if by and large as an industry, we continue to neglect our junior talent? Well, I have to kind of flip it around. And at IBM, we kind of go almost the opposite where we focus so much on interns and bringing those interns up and new hires. And we even have a boot camp for new hires. So when you're hired as a new hire within IBM, you go through this boot camp to teach you everything that you need to know about working at IBM and, and enterprise design thinking and so forth. And so we really do foster those relationships and, and bring them around. I, our interns, we really do hope that they become part of our IBM design community. And if you don't hire new hires and you're you're just always hiring just from the, the middle or higher up and beyond, you, you need that thought process from every different, I would say, level of, um, of design. You need that, that, that fresh, designers coming in with all these new ideas and trying new concepts and then people that have been working in the industry for some time that are able to help teach these new designers how to do things that will help them or, or create better designs. And you, you, you need, it's just like anything, if you just have too much of one thing, it's never, good enough. You need to spread the wealth and have somebody across from the beginning, the middle and the higher echelon to be able to do fantastic work. That's my opinion. Yeah. I 100%. Think, yeah. Develop that talent people. It's really, really important. And I tell Trace you the talent that's out there nowadays when they're new hires is really amazing. It, it continually blows me away. I'm like, wow, what happened to me back then? <laughs> I, I wish I was, you know, as brilliant as these people coming right out of school. They blow me away. Yeah. Yeah. They are. There's some pretty special people coming. There are. Yeah. 
So thinking about the future of our field and the people that are working in it, what are you most, what's your biggest hope or wish for those people over the coming years? In user experience. Yeah. That we do keep working together, listening to our product users, incorporating their feedback to continually improve the products that they are using to make the best user experience possible. Perfect. What a great note to wrap things up on. Tracy, I've really enjoyed today's conversation. Thank you for so generously sharing your stories and your insights, your experiences with us today. I'm sure that a lot of people will get a lot of value out of this episode. Well, thank you, Brendan. It's been a, a pleasure and uh, I, I enjoyed the talk and love meeting you too. Oh, you're most welcome. Tracy, if people want to find out more about what you're up to, about IBM and what's going on there, what's the best way for them to do that? They can get me on LinkedIn. Hit me up on LinkedIn. I check it and I'll answer you back, I promise. Perfect. Thanks, Tracy. And to everyone else that's tuned in, it's been great having you here as well. Everything that we've covered, including where you can find Tracy on LinkedIn, will be in the show notes on YouTube and also on your podcast platform. If you've enjoyed the show and you want to hear more great conversations like this with world-class leaders in UX design and product management, don't forget to leave a review on the podcast and subscribe. And also, if you think that someone else that you know would get value out of these conversations, then pass the podcast along to them as well. If you want to reach out to me, you can find me on LinkedIn under Brendan Jarvis. There's a link to my LinkedIn profile in the show notes as well, or you can head on over to thespaceinbetween.co.nz. And until next time, keep being brave.